Hi everybody and welcome back for another exciting week of marketing. Um, as we get started this week, we're going to be talking about chapter at, chapter 18, which is Integrated Marketing Communications, uh, oftentimes abbreviated as IMC. Um, and Integrated Marketing Communications is a really big, bulky, large term, right? So we often refer to IMC um, as promotion, okay? So we've talked about the four P's. This is the final P that you'll be learning about this semester. That is the promotion P, uh, which is sort of just a shorthand term for integrated marketing communications. Uh, that being said, we do have three basic tasks of promotion. Uh, those are to inform, persuade, and remind. And I will tell you a little bit in just a moment about how those uh, differ in each stage of the product life cycle. But again, this is very important that you know the three basic tasks of promotion are to inform, to persuade, and to remind. Okay, so um, promotion as a whole does encompass a lot of different communication disciplines, um, meaning that when we say promotion, we're referring to everything from advertising to personal selling, sales promotions, public relations, direct marketing, and even online and social and mobile marketing as well. So all these things work together as a part of this integrated marketing communications, um, hence the term integrated there. They're all, all these uh, different communication disciplines are integrated together um, to provide some clarity, some consistency, and maximum communicative impact for um, our buyers and our consumers. Okay, so again, the most important thing here Three basic tasks of promotion are to inform, persuade, and remind. So as we look at this with the product life cycle, you can see, um, based on this curve here, in each stage of the product life cycle, um, we can see each of these um, objectives, so to speak, of promotion operating slightly differently. Okay, so early on, earlier in the product life cycle, our goal is just to inform. So you can see here, introduction stage, um, we are trying to just inform. There's not a whole lot of growth, just a little bit here. So our goal is to make people aware of our products, tell people about our products, that kind of thing. Okay. Whereas as we enter the growth stage of the product life cycle, this is important, our goal here is to convince our consumers to purchase our brand as opposed to our competitor's brand. So we're trying to persuade them to purchase our product here in the growth stage. So again, Introduction stage, just letting them know our product exists. Growth stage, hey, you need to buy our product, right? And then over here in the maturity stage, we are just trying to keep our eye out there. People know about our product. We're just trying to make sure that our name stays in the public eye. We're trying to, uh, trying to trigger consumers' memory about our products, remind them about our product um, in the maturity stage. Okay, so introduction, growth, and maturity stage of the product life cycle. You can see inform, persuade, and remind. Um, objectives there respectively. Okay, so the communication process is something that I've always really enjoyed. I will say it is one of the more obvious, pretty straightforward concepts in marketing, but uh, given this is our last chapter, people usually appreciate that. Uh, so talking here about our communication process, um, our message typically originates with the person that we refer to as the sender. Okay, and oftentimes the sender is working with some kind of creative department uh, that can be anybody from an in-house marketing agency, advertising agency, whatever, to develop um, some type of marketing communications highlighting the product. And when that marketing department or that external agency receives that information from the sender and then takes it and transforms it into some type of uh, promotional material, we refer to that person as the transmitter, okay? This is the person who usually, again, it is the marketing department or some kind of external agency, but they take that information from the sender and they transform it uh, for use in, um, in, in marketing communications. And this person is the transmitter, okay? So that process as a whole, when the sender's ideas are converted into some type of verbal or visual message, um, that's the process of what we refer to as encoding, okay? So the transmitter does the encoding. So the sender sends the message, transmitter takes that message and turns it into some type of visual material, verbal material that can then be shared with our consumers and marketed, um, and that process is referred to as encoding, okay? So um, 
and and typically that transmitter once they've encoded the information and it's available in some type of verbal or visual message um, that information is shared via the communication channel um, and that's just a fancy term to refer to essentially the medium that we're using whether that be print advertising broadcasting the internet um, whatever medium that carries the message uh, we term that the communication channel um, now the person who receives the message um, they, they read it they hear it they see it and they process that information that's contained in the message obviously the person who receives that information we refer to as the receiver I think that's uh, pretty creative right in marketing um, so the person who receives the message is the receiver and then that process they go through is they interpret the sender's message and try to decipher it we refer to that as a decoding okay so you can sort of see um, I have a visual here in just a second where I will show you um, how this works but I think you can kind of see from sender all the way to receiver how the communication process is structured so here's a little question for you um, let's talk about progressive you know we all know Flo from progressive and she's out there uh, with all these great advertisements so progressive typically places their advertisements on local radio stations uh, they also put them in the yellow pages of the phone book and these communications are directed at the blank the person who will decode the message um, hopefully if you were paying attention you know that the person who decodes the message is the good job it should be the receiver the receiver is the person who decodes the message okay the, the decoder is not not a thing <laughs> um, okay so as we look at this um, we also can talk a little bit about noise okay so in the same way that you think about noise when you're trying to do something right when I'm when I'm making these videos and I'm doing laundry and my washing machine and dryer are dinging telling me my clothes are done you know that is um, that's noise in um, in the process here so noise is any interference that stems from competing messages or maybe from a lack of clarity in that message or maybe even a flaw in the medium but the bottom line is that this interference this noise poses a problem for all the different communication channels and usually if there's a difference between the encoding what the sender is trying to say and decoding what the receiver actually hears typically this discrepancy is likely caused by noise so here's an example for you I want you to to think about this before you answer um, so all of the following are noise in the communication process except a three competing ads on the same page of a magazine B music flashing lights and hot temperatures in the store dressing room C important news stories in the newspaper with bold headlines D two people with a shared frame of reference or E a crying child in a ringing telephone while you're watching television the correct answer here should be D okay two people who share a frame of reference there's no noise okay because remember noise is when there's a difference between the decoding and the encoding process so a difference in what the sender intends to say and what the receiver hears now if um, two people share a frame of reference there's clarity in the message because both people understand what's happening there's no interference stemming from competing messages there's no terminology that uh, can be interpreted in two different ways because these people share the same frame of reference okay so hopefully that gives you a little perspective and I'll give you another example in a second but here's a visual as we were talking about the communication process again we see the sender here with Pepsi they give their information to this marketing agency who serves as the transmitter to encode the message and create some type of visual or verbal advertisement which we can see here on the screen um, that is then shared through the media through the communications channel and then the customer the receiver decodes the message and trying to understand what Pepsi originally intended okay now there is a process of feedback so in the same way that I read your papers every week and I write a couple of paragraphs and leave you some feedback each week um, we see that as well here in the communication process and we refer to this as the feedback loop this just allows the receiver to communicate with the sender and in that same way inform the sender whether the message was received and decoded correctly in the way that they intended so uh, this feedback can take a lot of different forms it can be just the consumer purchasing the item if that's what the sender intended it could be um, 
the receiver complaining or maybe giving a compliment. It could be redeeming a coupon or a rebate, or it could be uh, tweeting about the product on Twitter. So the feedback may take a lot of different appearances in, in, in marketing it from the receiver's perspective, but in, in the end, there's some type of goal or objective that the sender and the transmitter are hoping that the receiver will eventually accomplish. Okay, so a lot of times we see um, a receiver will decode a certain message in, in a certain way. And no matter how many times you, you explain something to someone, sometimes people just take it differently than you intended. I'm sure you've said something before when people just take it the wrong way, right? Well, the same thing happens with marketing. And um, some different people who oftentimes are shown the exact same message can receive the message in a totally different way. Here's an example. Um, this is an advertisement from Coke um, from their 125 years campaign where they were celebrating um, their product being in existence for that long. And you can see here um, this Coke bottle with all these people's faces, all these employees on it. It's great. They're happy. Well, if you're a Coke lover and you just absolutely love Coke products and you've been buying them for years, this might convey satisfaction for you. You might be happy. Okay, but if you recently just went on a diet or you're trying to be more health conscious, cut out soda, cut out sugar, um, carbonated beverages, whatever it is, you might feel some sense of loss. You might be a little upset, like, oh gosh, Coke. Um, now, if you're a non user, like let's say you're one of those dirty Pepsi shoppers and you really enjoy um, drinking Pepsi instead of Coke, you might just be disgusted by this advertisement. Or even worse, what if you're a Coke employee and Coke just had this huge layoff? You might be angry when you see that advertisement, okay? So the sender though, when they make this advertisement and they're conveying to the transmitter what they wanna see, they don't really have a whole lot of control over what meaning you as the individual receiver will take from this message. So um, it, this can be a challenging part of, of the promotion P and of, integrated marketing communications because receivers decode messages differently. Okay, so here's an example for you. Let's talk about Ed for a second. Ed has three engineering degrees. Um, he is working on his house and he's hired an interior decorator to come and update his home. And he's super frustrated when he asks her all these questions that, that he thinks are simple questions about weight bearing walls and insulation requirements and the designer is just unable to understand, yet, you know, Ed has the same problems when she starts talking about mauve and cerise and magenta, and I'm probably saying those first two incorrectly, um, but magenta and all these colors and all these things, and um, we want to know, why is the communication process uh, not working in this instance? Why is um, the communication process not working? Is it because noise is interfering with encoding and decoding? Is it because the wrong medium has been used? Is it because the sender and receiver don't share overlapping frames of reference? Or is it because personal selling should not be used to market this product? You can probably narrow this down to letters A and C, that noise is interfering with the encoding and decoding process, and C, that the sender and receiver do not share overlapping frames of reference. Um, kind of like standardized testing, this is the one of those questions where you do have to pick the best answer, and I could certainly see why you might want to say A, noise is interfering with encoding and decoding, but the best answer in this case is that the sender and the receiver do not share overlapping frames of reference. Remember, if the designer knew about load-bearing walls and insulation requirements, and Ed knew about all these design things like magenta and mauve and cer cerise, cerise, whatever, um, they would have an overlapping frame of reference, and um, they would not necessarily have this issue, but in this case, they do not share that frame of reference, and that is causing the communication process to not work properly in this situation. Okay, um, so this brings me to our next discussion, which is the ADA model. Um, and typically, marketing communications move consumers stepwise through a series of mental stages. Uh, there are several models for this. I like the ADA model. This can also be referred to as the think, feel, do model. Uh, but I prefer this one. The ADA model essentially just suggests that awareness, the A, leads to interest, the I, which leads to desire, the D, and then to action, the A. And at each stage in this process, the consumer will make a judgment about whether they want to take the next step in the process. 
Uh, I told you this can also be termed the think, feel, do model, which is common, but I like ADA better and um, because in certain cases, consumers may not necessarily follow the steps of the ADA model in order. So think about like an impulse purchase where you're like, oh my gosh, they have Starburst jelly beans. It's Easter. Boom. I'm going to throw these in the cart. Okay. Um, that's an impulse purchase. So I may feel and do before I actually think about it. Well, do I really need all that sugar? I'm supposed to be on a diet. Do I really need to eat these? You know, so um, think will do is great, but I prefer the term ADA for this reason. Here's a little chart that just shows you how the ADA model works all the way through awareness, interest, desire, and action. Of course, we are going to go through each of these individually. So starting with awareness, um, even the absolute best marketing communications can be wasted if the sender doesn't gain attention from the consumer first. So brand awareness as a whole refers to a potential customer's ability to recognize or recall the brand name in a particular type of um, product or service. So there's two types of awareness we really look at. We look at aided recall and we look at top of mind awareness. Okay. Aided recall is exactly what it sounds like. This is where with some aid, with a little bit of assistance, um, consumers can usually indicate that they know a brand when it's presented. So um, I ask you about laundry detergent and I say, oh, you know, what all have you heard of? And you say, oh, there's Tide, there's Gain. And I say, okay, yep, well, what about Arm & Hammer? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of Arm & Hammer, yeah, but I, I remember that now. Okay, that's aided recall because I've mentioned it and you're like, yeah, yeah, I, kn I knew that existed now that you say that. Okay, whereas the, the awareness you really want all of your consumers to have is top of mind awareness. And this is the highest level of awareness. It occurs when consumers mention a certain brand name first when they're asked about a product or service. So I say laundry detergent and you say Tide. I say dishwashing liquid and you say Dawn. I say fabric software and you say snuggle. Okay, whatever it may be. I say rain jacket and you say North Face. Um, you know, whatever it might be. Um, that top of mind awareness is the first thing that comes to mind. And I love in an in-person classroom where I can say, okay, things like that. I can say, okay, I say cereal and you say Frosted Flakes. I say, um, you know, shoes and you say Nike or whatever. And I love hearing what you guys have to say about this. It's a little difficult to do an activity like that in an online class, but hopefully I kind of get the feel for how that works here through this video. Um, so again, a high top of mind awareness just means that the brand enters what we refer to as the evoked set of brands. So it's evoked from your memory um, when you decide to shop for that certain product or certain service. Okay, and typically as a manufacturer, as a retailer, a service provider, you can build that top of mind awareness by having some memorable names, um, repeatedly exposing you to advertising, um, location, sponsorships, memorable symbols, we talked in the past about slogans and jingles and some of those things. Um, so for example, I would say like a good neighbor and you would say State Farm is there. You can build top of mind awareness um, in, in those types of ways as well. And, and we've talked about those things in previous weeks, so I don't think it's necessary to go into a ton of detail here, but just know that those things are connected. Okay, um, as far as awareness goes, an omni-channel approach is one of the best things to do if you're trying to increase the likelihood that a message will be received. Um, hopefully you remember what omni-channel means from uh, last week. As we're talking about omni-channel marketing, um, we're talking about marketing in very different channels, typically both in person in stores and also online. And that is one of the best ways to generate awareness for your product. Okay, so once we have gotten that certain level of awareness, our customers know that our product or our company exists, we next want to work to increase the customer's interest level in our product. So it isn't just enough to let people know that the product exists. We actually have to persuade, remember, inform, persuade, and remind, we have to persuade our customers that our product is worth investigating. Okay, and there's a lot of different ways we can do this. Um, I'm going to give you some examples about Stouffer's lasagna, focusing on real ingredients, and Disney and all their stars television shows. I'll give you a couple different examples in just a moment. But once we have gotten that awareness and we've developed that interest, we next want to try to go ahead and move on to the desire stage. And this is where we 
move consumers from the, oh, I like it to, I want it, I must have it, right? This is where we change in that stage. Um, so Stouffer's frozen lasagna is great, and yeah, they use real ingredients, but you know, we're all about green today and healthy lifestyles, and we do not want to eat frozen foods, right? So Stouffer's changes this just a little bit. They tell us, you know, their ingredients are all uh, fresh and blah, 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 and then frozen, and um, they teach us how to dress up these frozen dinners with just a few extra steps, and that helps um, allow people to see, oh, hey, if I dress this meal up and I add a few things to it, man, I can move from, hey, I like that idea to, oh, I want this. I'm going to buy Stouffer's and I'm just going to do a few little things real quick and make sure we have this. Okay. Um, and finally, this brings us to the action stage. And, and typically, this is the ultimate goal of any form of marketing communications. Um, and that's just driving the receiver of that message to action. Um, typically, action means you're purchasing the product, but not always. Um, it can mean other things as well, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, generally speaking, as long as your message has caught consumers' attention, made them interested enough to consider the product, as a means to satisfy a specific desire of theirs, they're typically going to go ahead and act on that interest by searching for the product, making a purchase, whatever it might be. Um, this is something important that you know as well. So to help um, this action stage, this is where point of purchase displays in grocery stores, coupons, premiums, trial size packages, this is when all of those things are most useful when the consumer is near the action stage of the ADA model, okay? So, you know, if you are already interested in Stouffer's lasagna and you want to know how um, this product can, you know, be spiced up a little bit to um, be something that you want to purchase, a point of purchase display, like say um, Sam's Club has a little uh, per point of purchase display there and they've um, spice this up with the extra ingredients that Stouffer's wanted. Um, you know, if they're there and you're already really close to this action stage, you already have um, your interest and your desire and, of course, your awareness, now you want to act. That point of purchase display really helps you go ahead and move to that action stage. So um, I already told you purchase is one type of action, but there can be other things. So for example, it can just be a behavior change. Like maybe you see all these awesome advertisements about not drinking and driving and you decide um, to, to follow that. Or maybe um, your attitude changes. So you used to think, oh man, that product's not very good quality. And then you, you see a point of purchase display or you're really close to this action stage and you're like, man, I, I changed my mind. This is actually a good product. Or um, maybe it's some kind of physical action they're trying to get you to do. Maybe it's logging onto a website, voting a certain way, picking up the phone and calling someone, volunteering, whatever it might be. Um, action can be more than just a purchase. Okay, so now something else that's important to know is sometimes consumers don't always act immediately after they receive some type of marketing communication. There is this uh, term that we refer to as the lagged effect. And this is just a delayed response to a marketing communication campaign. So it kind of lags a little bit, if you will. And in this case, multiple exposures are often necessary to encourage people to make this purchase, to take the next step. And sometimes it's really difficult to determine which exposure actually led to the purchase. You know, was it a YouTube video? Was it uh, social mobile marketing? Was it a catalog? Was it a radio ad? Was it TV? You know, what, what made this customer finally click and say, man, I am going to buy that or I'm gonna I'm gonna act on this you know what was it so okay as we continue moving through here uh, we do have some various elements of an integrated marketing communication strategy uh, these do vary from being interactive to passive and from being online to offline so as you're looking at something that is um, interactive and also online, we can talk about mobile marketing, we can talk about blogs and social media. Those are all really active ways to engage your consumers um, online. Okay, you can also um, passively engage your consumers online as well uh, in something like email marketing where you just get an email, you may or may not read it. Um, there are also less interactive forms of marketing offline. So something that is um, less interactive and also offline could be like um, getting a catalog in the mail, uh, maybe getting some coupons in the mail, PR, some of that stuff. Are, those are typically your less interactive, more passive actions that are also offline. And then you have some offline interactions that are interactive like 
um, contest, telemarketing, personal selling. So lots of different things to think about here. And we're going to look at each of these together. But the most important thing here is that to get the right message to the right audience and through the right medium, um, an IMC planner really has to understand how each medium communicates and how to combine it with other media to generate the most impact. So you're probably not just going to do um, email marketing. You're probably not just going to do a catalog. You might do a little bit of all these things, right? And it just depends on what your product is and the business and, and what's going to work best for you based on your budget. Okay. So as we keep moving through here, um, it's important to note that marketers do have a repertoire of IMC channels. Um, and, and this repertoire is really expanded, but also um, ways in which marketers can communicate with customers has also expanded in recent years. So uh, this is why the term direct marketing actually appeared in all of those boxes. Okay, so you can expand your traditional media with advertising and PR and sales promotions uh, from purely offline approaches to also include a combination of offline and online, which has been increasingly more successful in recent years. That goes back to that omni-channel marketing we were just talking about. So combining the online and offline uh, marketing endeavors can usually be a positive experience for everyone. So let's look at a few of these things individually. When we talk about advertising, we're all probably familiar with what advertising means. This is just the placement of announcements and persuasive messages in time or space purchased in any of the mass media by business firms, nonprofit organizations, so on and so forth. And usually um, the goal here is to inform or persuade members of a particular market or audience about certain products, certain services, certain ideas, organizations, whatever it might be. Uh, the key here is that advertising is extremely, extremely effective for creating awareness for a product or a service, or sometimes even just for generating interest about a product or a service. So uh, I think that's something important to remember for this week is that you know advertising is really effective for um, the awareness and interest components of the ADA model that we were just talking about not too long ago. Okay, um, we can break up advertising into a couple different chunks. Uh, for example, institutional advertising is any type of advertising intended to promote a company, a corporation, a business, institution, organization, or other similar entity. So we're advertising for an institution, okay? An example of this is Procter & Gamble. Okay, so uh, this is kind of sneaky, but Procter & Gamble, they run all these ads that promote its children's safe drinking water program, where they show all of their P&G employees uh, teaching people all around the world how to purify their water. Um, and this was originally instituted because over 5,000 children die almost every day from diseases caused by unsafe drinking water. So... Um, it originally started as an intention for them to help people, but also sort of turned into a form of institutional advertising um, in that they are also promoting for their own company. So take a moment just to watch uh, this advertising about Procter & Gamble. And to millions of families around the world, this is considered drinking water. So P&G, the makers of Tide, Dawn & Crest, invented a powder that transforms dirty water from this to this. After 175 years of creating cleaning products for families around the world, P&G understands the power of clean water. Together with our partners, the P&G Children's Safe Drinking Water Program has been providing clean water for more than 10 years in over 75 countries. Clean water not only helps save lives, it transforms lives. Now Boniface will grow strong. He'll spend more days in school. He'll enjoy more birthdays and a brighter future. If you've purchased a PNG brand over the past 10 years, then you've been a part of this life-changing program. Help us continue to share the power of clean water. Okay, so hopefully you can see what they're doing here. Uh, notice the Tide emblem here. Tide is a Procter & Gamble product. So um, they're essentially, yes, they're doing something great. They are helping um, people who need drinking water, and that is uh, clean drinking water, and that is a wonderful thing. But notice that they are um, 
you know, putting a plug in for their product. Hey, if you buy Tide, you're supporting children in Africa who need clean drinking water. And um, that's true. It's a form of institutional advertising because, um, you know, they are doing these great things and helping these people. Um, and they do that because you're able to buy their products. Next, you see Dawn, also a PNG product. You see Crest, also a PNG product, uh, so on and so forth. So if you're buying these products, you're helping people um, create that clean drinking water that these children oftentimes need. Okay, so as we return, um, mass advertising is also another form of advertising that can really entice customers into a conversation with marketers, but it doesn't really require as much action on part of consumers, okay? It's generally placed more on the passive end of the spectrum. So, and traditionally, a lot of advertising has always in the past been very passive, typically offline. Um, you know, you see like a magazine or a newspaper ad. Uh, maybe you see a catalog, um, TV advertising. Um, whereas in more recent years, there's been a ton of growth in online advertising and these more interactive features of advertising. Okay, so next we're going to talk about PR, uh, short for public relations, and this is the organizational function that manages firms' communications to achieve a variety of objectives, um, including building and maintenance um, of a positive image, handling or heading off some unfavorable stories or events, and maintaining positive relationships with the media. So we all probably know an organization's PR person, you can probably think here, of our university's PR person. Um, like advertising, PR is usually a relatively passive form of um, integrated marketing communications in that consumers really don't have to take any action or do anything to receive it. They just kind of listen, right? Um, the exciting part of PR for your firm is that PR efforts do generate a, some free media attention. Okay, you're not having to pay for this. It's usually um, just, just free advertising in a way. Okay, um, moving on, we're going to talk about sales promotions as well. The sales promotions are special incentives or excitement building programs such as coupons, rebates, contests, free samples, point of purchase displays, um, and they usually just encourage the purchase of a product or a service. Now, notice that mark this is very important. Marketers typically design these incentives for use in conjunction with other advertising or personal selling programs. Okay, so it's not just the special incentive. They usually do go along with other advertising or other personal selling programs. Now, um, some of these are used to build short-term sales. Think about like a point of purchase display. That's where you see like the free samples. Um, whereas others are more so designed to build customer loyalty as a part of a customer relationship management or CRM program. Okay, uh, this leads us to push and pull advertising. Um, it disappoints me a little bit that your book doesn't really talk about this, but this is something really important that is essential to understanding integrated marketing communication. So um, I wanted to throw this in here for you. As we talk about push marketing, um, this is marketing that is geared towards helping the retailer sell more of a product, usually via promotions, um, pricing coverage, display, merchandising, um, geared towards helping the retailer, okay? Providing the retailer with the right tools and incentives to sell a product. That's push marketing, okay? Usually more brand-led. We also have pull marketing, which is geared towards driving the customer to visit specific locations to buy a product. And this is driven um, really more towards consumers. It's customer-led. It drives consumers into outlets by using both outlet knowledge and buyer behavior insights. Okay, so you can see push and pull advertising and oftentimes combining these two reinforces key brand and retailer objectives. So um, I'm going to give you a question about this um, on your quiz this week. Um, I think it's important that you know this. So here's an example of what you might see. So without looking at the answers, uh, Procter & Gamble uses a sense off campaign. Uh, they also use couponing and free samples to try to increase the sales of Tide detergent. So what type of promotional strategy is it using? Is it a push strategy, a pull strategy, personal selling? What are we looking at here? Um, the correct answer is that it is a pull promotional strategy. It's a pull strategy because the goal here is that Tide and Procter & Gamble is really trying to drive consumers into outlets by using both outlet knowledge 
and buyer behavior insights. They're driving the consumer to visit specific locations to buy their product. So anywhere that carries Tide, you can go and get this free sample. You can go and use a sense off campaign. You can use a coupon um, in any of these um, Tide um, places that carry Tide products, any of these retailers that carry Tide products. This is a pull strategy. Okay, personal selling. You're all probably familiar with personal selling. No doubt you've encountered a car salesman or when you go to Verizon to buy a cell phone, you've encountered someone who sells cell phones or furniture sales. You're probably familiar with personal selling. Uh, we define this as the two-way flow of communication between a buyer and a seller that is designed to influence the buyer's purchase decision. Um, and this is, can, can really take place in a variety of settings. It can be face-to-face, -face, it can be over the phone, internet, um, video conferencing. Um, a lot of times customers don't um, oftentimes want to interact with professional salespeople. Um, personal selling represents a really, really important channel in many of these integrated marketing communication programs, especially in our business to business settings. And um, a lot of times, you know, you can go through and you can buy a product or enroll in a service without really having to have the help from a salesperson. But um, these salespeople do save customers a lot of time and a lot of effort. And for this reason, sales representatives can add a whole lot of value, which um, you know, makes it worthwhile for employers to incur that additional expense of employing them. So here's a question for you. Which of the following statements does not describe an advantage of personal selling um, and that advantage that personal selling has over other forms of production? A, that personal selling is less expensive on a per contact basis. B, that personal selling is better for providing customers with detailed demonstrations of products. C, that it's easier to vary the message according to what the customer needs to know with personal selling. D, that it's easier to direct the marketing effort to directly to qualified prospects with personal selling. That's worded a little funny. Or E, that personal selling costs can be controlled by adjusting the size of the sales force. The correct answer here should be A, uh, personal selling is less expensive on a per contact basis. That is not an advantage, it's actually a disadvantage that um, personal selling is actually more expensive on a per contact basis. So it's not, um, it's, it's neither true nor an advantage. So this would be the correct answer to this particular question because it asks which one is not an advantage. Um, okay. Moving on to direct marketing, this is one that you did see in each of those boxes earlier in our diagram here. Um, and that's because the integrated marketing channel that's received the greatest interest in aggregate spending recently is direct marketing. Um, so a lot of people are really focusing their efforts here. Um, and direct marketing is just marketing that communicates directly with target customers to generate a response or some form of transaction. Typically, when we think of direct marketing, we're thinking of those mail campaigns, we're thinking of catalogs sent through the mail, um, but direct marketing can also refer to email marketing, mobile marketing, and other forms um, online such as that. Okay, so we're going to move on um, just a little bit here to talk about online marketing. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here because you did read about a lot of this in Chapter 3. We talked about this as well in the Chapter 3 video lecture, so I'm just going to hit the highlights. I think we all know that in today's society, uh, we're seeing a lot more use of social media, websites, and blogs to really place an emphasis on communicating with customers online. A lot of firms, um, Amazon specifically, actually encourage um, customers to go online and post a review of products they've bought or they've used and to rate the quality sometimes of the website, of the quality of the items, of various things. So here's an example of um, you know Amazon site, someone's going on and they've been purchasing this um, Pizzazz uh, Plus rotating oven and you can go through and see um, they're getting so many stars, lots of five star ratings, a couple of fours, some threes, twos, and ones, and you can read um, the 1,189 customer reviews about this product if you have that much time on your hands. Um, now, you're probably also familiar with a blog or maybe even a vlog, uh, which a lot of times just contains these very frequent posts um, about a certain product. This can be used to communicate trends, create positive word of mouth, connect customers by forming a community, um, announce special events, um, 
respond directly to customers' comments about a certain issue or question. So these blogs and these vlogs are becoming more and more common in today's society. Of course, we all use social media, and social media can be very, very helpful um, in terms of facilitating the customer decision process, encouraging need recognition, information search, so on and so forth, all the way to that post-purchase evaluation. Um, so I believe you guys are familiar with those types of online marketing. What you're probably not familiar with is you know, how we measure some of our success in these online communities and how we see how well our integrated marketing communication campaign is doing. So a lot of times initially, marketers have set some type of strategic goal before they actually implement any kind of IMC campaign. Um, once they've established these goals, uh, typically marketers will set a budget for the campaign and choose some kind of marketing metrics to evaluate whether they've achieved those strategic objectives or not. And typically, for, you know, going back to goals for a second here, firms need to understand the outcome they really hope to achieve before they start. Okay, it does you no good just to say, oh, I'm going to do a social media marketing campaign, right? You need to sit down and look at your end goal, your outcome. Sometimes your goal is just a short-term goal. It can be like you want to increase awareness, you want to prompt trial, get people to try it. Um, or maybe sometimes it's more of a long-term goal. Um, like you want to increase sales, you want to increase market share, you want to develop customer loyalty, whatever it might be, it's important for you to explicitly define and measure uh, your goals. Make sure that your goals are measurable. Okay, so as we are talking about allocating our budgets and getting ready for that, there are a couple different budgeting methods you can use. Uh, we have the rule of thumb method, we have the objective and task method, um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I think you can spend some time reading this yourself. Um, what I do want to spend some time talking about is, um, you, you know, a key component in a lot of all of these objectives is as far as you're, you're measuring your reach and you're trying to measure the success of a certain campaign. So these are some metrics that we use um, for measuring success. We look at measuring reach, frequency, gross rating points, and web tracking. So we're going to talk about each of these. Um, typically, when we're talking about measuring IMC success, the firm should examine when and how consumers have been exposed to various marketing communications. And we do this by looking at measures of frequency and reach. Okay, This is how we gauge consumers' exposure to all of our marketing communications in whatever form those may have taken place. Now, when we talk about reach, we're talking about the percentage of the target population that has been exposed to a certain marketing communication, such as an advertisement, at least one time. Okay, so again, the percentage of the target population opposed to a certain type of marketing communication, such as an advertisement, at least once. That's reach. Now, when we talk about frequency, we're talking about how often, how many times the audience is exposed to that communication within a certain period of time. Okay, so the number or the frequency of exposures. Okay, so here's a, a little question for you, and you will see one of these on your quiz this week. Um, so I want you to suppose that a media planner has a budget of five million dollars. Okay, and the cost per thousand exposures, notice that keyword, the cost per thousand exposures was ten dollars. Now, the planner wanted to achieve a frequency of 20. So how can we calculate what the planner's reach would be? Well, there's this equation we use, reach times frequency. Fre whoa, I sound like Bugs Bunny, frequency. The, the reach times the frequency times the cost per 1,000 exposures is equal to our budget in this case. So uh, we know our budget is $5 million. We're trying to find our reach. We know from our problem here that our frequency is 20, and we notice that our cost per 1,000 exposures is $10. So in this case, you're gonna you take your 10 as your numerator um, and divide it by 1,000 exposures. So we get this equation in the end, 5 million equals R for reach times 20, our frequency, times 10 over 1,000. If you multiply this all out, 
you get 25 million households as our reach, okay, 25 million, which is pretty darn impressive, right? Um, although for $5 million, we certainly hope that we reach a lot of people. Okay, um, so make sure you know how to do these types of questions. You will see these again. Okay, referring to traditional media, marketing communications managers usually state their media objectives in terms of gross rating points, abbreviated as GRP. Um, and this just is calculated by multiplying reach times frequency. So you can see the equation here, GRP equals reach times frequency. Um, and this GRP measure can refer to print, radio, TV, um, whatever it may be, but any comparisons require a single medium, okay? Meaning you can't um, compare print and TV advertising with the same GRP points, okay? You must compare print advertising for Apple to print advertising of oranges, okay? Um, so as we go through, um, again, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this just because we are kind of short on time, although this is one of my absolute favorite topics in marketing and I do wanna um, ensure that you get some information. So I have included a lot of extra details that your book doesn't necessarily go into here because I've talked to a lot of you guys personally this semester who want to go on and work in social and mobile marketing and I want to provide you and equip you with the resources um, necessary to do that. So um, one final way that we measure our success in um, with our marketing campaigns online is typically through web tracking software. And this web tracking software usually measures how much time viewers spend on a certain web page. It can also tell you the number of pages they viewed on your site, how many times they clicked on a certain ad, and even what website they came from before they came to your site. So this web tracking software is pretty impressive, and you see this a lot uh, in fine print at the top of your page. Uh, you know, our site uses web tracking software. We use cookies. We use this or that to monitor um, what you're doing online. So now, all of these different performance metrics can usually be easily, easily measured and accessed using Google Analytics. Uh, Facebook does this as well. There are Facebook Analytics if you wanna go and look at those. Um, I left you some videos here about how to make a splash in social media marketing and some tips for tracking your social media efforts. These are pretty lengthy videos. Um, when I say lengthy, I mean like really long. So, you know, I don't want to make this video three hours long for you, so I, I have included the links here. You can go and you may watch these on your own time, um, but I would encourage you to watch them. They will be very helpful to you if you ever plan on doing any kind of social media marketing in your lifetime. Okay. Um, all right. That being said, I want to just briefly also comment on search engine marketing, what we call SEM. This is a type of web advertising where companies pay for keywords, okay? Um, they pay for these keywords that are really used to catch consumers' attention while they're browsing a search engine. So if Mr. Harrison is looking to purchase um, a some new kitchen cabinets, okay, I might type in, um, you know, oak cabinets, or I might type in white cabinets, or I might type in whatever. Whatever I'm typing in are most common keywords. Um, you want to include those same words on your landing page of your website so that as you are typing in these words and, and consumers are, are searching for these things, um, they immediately draw your site. Well, how do you know um, what words to use? You know, How do you know what people are searching? Well, Google has a program called Google AdWords, and it is, it's a search engine marketing tool offered by Google that allows advertisers to really um, kind of make an appearance or show up in those sponsored links at the top of the page. Um, and it, it's all based on the keywords that potential customers might use. So I do want to take a moment and show you this video just briefly about how Google AdWords works and operates just to give you an idea. I'm creating my Wix site. You think you already have a stunning website? That's cool. You're welcome to skip or... Okay, sorry. All right, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Surfside PPC YouTube channel. Today, we're going to be answering the question, what is Google AdWords? So we have the home screen of AdWords up here, and Google AdWords is an advertising service created by Google where advertisers can run their ads and try to reach ready-to-buy customers. Um, so your goal with Google AdWords is to use some of their different ad formats that they have available for you. 
uh, for example, display ads, video ads, search ads, app ads, to advertise whatever your product or service is by using the different targeting available by Google AdWords. So for example, with display ads, you can target websites, you can target interests, you can target remarketing audiences, you can run your ads on different uh, apps, you can run it in Gmail, so there's all sorts of places to run your display ads. For video ads, you can run them as pre-roll ads before videos or mid-roll ads that run during the video. Um, so your video ads can run all over the place. Um, sometimes in articles, they'll also appear uh, as people are scrolling through them. Search ads appear on the Google Search Network. Uh, so obviously the biggest uh, biggest part of the search network is the actual Google search engine. Um, but they also have search partners like Ask.com, NewYorkTimes.com, some different websites where people will search a lot for different products. And Google search ads will come up and you can target those keywords. App ads you can run anywhere across the Google network um, on search, on display. You can run your app ad within other apps. Um, so to get more downloads to your apps, there's all sorts of different ways uh, to run your app ads around the internet. When it comes to search advertising, one of the big things is you want to target keywords in the Google search engine and their search partners. Uh, so for, for example, here we have a Taboola ad. So Taboola is a native ads platform. What they've done is when someone types in PPC advertising, they have their own native ads platform come up so they can drive traffic there. That's their goal is to get more people to go there and start doing PPC advertising on their channel because PPC advertising is kind of a vague search. Someone could be looking for companies. Someone could be looking for uh, you know, services like Taboo where they can run their ads. So that's why search ads are so important because you can find ready-to-buy customers as they're searching for different products, services, and whatever they, whatever they want to buy at that time. So uh, after search ads, you have display ads. So here's an example. At the top is a Wayfair ad, and also along the side, the left-hand side, you'll see the rope with the candle. Those are both display ads that are running on ESPN. You can target you know, your remarketing audiences, but your placements, including websites, apps, and videos. Uh, you can use the interest audiences available from Google Display Network. Uh, so Google AdWords lets you run your ad all over the internet, uh, different display ads. You can send traffic to different pages on your website. And it's a great way to reach ready-to-buy customers, especially if you know how to use remarketing audiences and dynamic remarketing, like what they're showing here. So here's an example of a pre-roll ad on actually my YouTube video, the Gmail ads tutorial. Um, so if you go to one of my videos, you can see that ads usually run beforehand because I have it set up for that. So Wix is running their ad before my ad. They pay per view. And what their goal is is to get someone to click on their call to action in the bottom left-hand corner where it says start your website now. Uh, so this is an example of a video ad. They run on the Google Display Network, uh, which includes all of YouTube and then all sorts of websites where videos are ran. Uh, you'll see ads run before their videos or even in the middle of their videos. So here's an example of an app ad in search. Um, so if someone types in adventure games, you can see that an ad comes up for this app, Adventure Duck. So the whole goal is to get people to go into the app, download it for free, and as they're playing the game, they probably either have upgrades that people can buy or they have ads on their game where they, where they can make more money from it. So if you have an app... Okay, guys, so I'm going to stop here. You can, I think you've gotten an idea just from the short little clip about what exactly Google AdWords is and how it can really be used to help market a, a certain product or draw people to your website specifically. So I'm going to stop here. Feel free to watch the rest of this video if you'd like. Again, I did share lots of other resources for you here as well about um, social mobile marketing. Really quickly, I just want to give you a few other um Important terms here that are pretty essential in estimating reach. Um, we we have what is called um, impressions. Okay, impressions are um, just it, this refers to the number of times the ad appears in front of the user. We also have what are called click through rates. And then this is just the number of times a user clicks on an ad divided by the number of times of impressions. And then finally, relevance describes how useful an ad message is to the consumer doing the search. So these are just some different ways that we can measure search engine marketing success and to uh, take a look at those. So again, I did leave you with some extra videos here on the end as well to tell you all about online marketing, um, search engine marketing, Google AdWords. This is all here if you need it. Um, I hope that you are able to get a feel a little bit for this promotion P. You can actually take an entire class on just promotion, and I encourage you to do that. Um, my job here, as an introductory, in, excuse me, introductory in a mar in an introductory marketing course, is really just to give you an idea of four P's to introduce you a little bit to how each of these work. But you can study promotion and advertising as a whole. Um, in depth on its own and a lot of you guys will probably go on to take an advertising class so 
I want you to be familiar with this terminology. I want you to know how it works. Promotion is definitely one of the most important keys. I mean, they're all important, but this one especially is, is what you think of when you think of marketing, for most people at least. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I will talk to you soon. Take care.